Okay, I'm going to start with my little bit of housekeeping because that's not the bit you're waiting to hear. So I'd like to welcome everyone to the second event in the Together 2022 Disability History Month Festival. My name is Stu Gosling. I'm Artistic Director of Together 2012. I'm a white woman with pale olive skin and green eyes behind black plastic glasses. I'm wearing a multi-coloured pattern satin shirt and silver coloured jewellery with cropped henna, henna hair under a purple trilby hat. This week we're celebrating our exhibitions. If you weren't able to make it on Tuesday night, you can find a recording of the event as well as the exhibition links on our website. So with me at the moment on the screen is Chris Burrow, who's our sign language interpreter. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of audio description because Chris is signing. Chris is a blonde woman. She's a blonde white woman. She's wearing a blue top over a black vest and she has a blue background. So I'm delighted to welcome you here tonight to celebrate our fine art embroidery exhibition, Untangled Threads, and to welcome our artists, Nudla Abramson, Zipporah Johnston and Kate Rollison. I'm proud to say that Kate also works part time as our youth development worker. And if anybody would like details about our youth work, then please pop your email address or your phone number into the live chat. I should have said before, we have access to live chat, just click on the button. And we also have sort of formal webinar Q&A. So if you've got a direct question, put it in the Q&A. And if you'd like to make a point, then put it in the chat. But we don't really mind. We just love to hear from you. So the artists are going to introduce themselves and their work. And then I'm going to ask some questions, but we'd really like to really have your questions. So I'm going to invite Kate Rollison to start first and to introduce herself and her work. Hi, I'm Kate Rollison. As Ju said, I'm youth development worker at Together 2012 and I'm also a hand embroidery artist. I'm a white woman with shoulder length brown hair with a fringe. I'm wearing a greenish yellow jumper and I've got green and white beaded long earrings on. Um, and I'm going to share my presentation. There we go. So this is me working on a commission that I did back in May. And to the right is another commission I did some years ago of a wedding dress, a 40s wedding dress, not actually for a wedding, for a photo shoot. Um, but what I'm focusing on tonight is the embroideries from the Untamed Threads exhibition, which are on the theme of animals. So growing up on the edge of Epping Forest and with holidays in the Scottish Highlands, animals have been very important to me. Um, they come up time and time again in folklore and fairy tales and symbolise many things. And I hope some of the magic of animals comes across in my artwork. I'm particularly interested in slightly maligned, maybe more unloved animals, um, such as snails, spiders and geese. I've become a little bit obsessed with geese, in fact, but I'll get onto that in a bit. Um, so these are some embroideries I've done of snails and spiders over the years. Um, this is like a shadow puppet spider. And I'll move on to the first embroidery that I show in the exhibition. So this is a detail from the goose eggs quilt. The central motif embroidery of the two geese either tearing apart or putting back together a heart with feathers flying above was made in February 2021 around Valentine's Day while we were still in lockdown. Um, I think Valentine's Day can be quite a lonely time for a lot of people. It's a commercialised holiday and doesn't make everyone feel great. And obviously some lockdown blues seeped into this piece. Uh, time and again in music and literature, geese come up as a symbol of loneliness, which I find quite interesting. And for me, they're also a symbol of wilderness and the savagery of nature. So the patchwork that's around the embroidery is in a technique called flying geese. So I feel like there's a few different layers going on here. Um, 
patched together out of different floral and patterned blue, yellow and white fabrics. Um, someone on Instagram commented that the fabric the embroidery is on uh, looks like airflow with all the different cross hatching. Um, airflow that, you know, the geese are flying through. Um, and a friend made the comment to me that she saw nature putting me back together when she looked at this piece, which I thought was better than my original <laughs> interpretation of it, um, which was that, you know, a heart was being torn apart. Um, but also this piece is very much influenced by folk art quilts. I'm actually sitting on a folk art quilt right now uh, with lots of animals on it. <laughs> so um, yeah, that was a big influence on this piece. And as I said, I've become a bit obsessed with geese. Our neighbours in the Highlands keep them and uh, her, she's a potter and uh, geese come into her pottery. And I began drawing them as well with a quill made from a goose feather, which I think has a nice circularity to it. The next piece. This is Being is Enough. So uh, this was an embroidery that I started in 2020, but finished in May 2021. And I often dip in and out of embroideries and come back to them when I feel able to or more inspired to. My therapist at the time in 2020 challenged me to make an artwork about belonging in the world uh, for myself or for anyone else who might need a reminder of that. So this piece is about being worthy simply by virtue of existing without having to sort of constantly strive and be in a frenzy of doing. It's about slowing down and being and practicing gratitude. Uh, for me, snails, so there's a big snail here, a banded snail with yellow and brown stripes. And snails for me symbolize resilient, tenacity, patience and home. They carry their homes with them, so are always at home. There's a lot of flower symbolism in this piece as well. So um, I use a technique called hapazome here, which is a Japanese technique where you put some flowers in the fabric fold it in half and use a hammer to pound the flowers into the fabric and they release their dye, uh, their colour in their petals onto the fabric. And the flowers I've used are self-heal and honesty, which I think relate to that idea of being is enough and belonging in the world and are quite self-explanatory. I've also embroidered honesty plants and self-heal coming up amongst the hapazome um, printed flowers. And to the left, I've embroidered a dandelion. And to the right, you might have to move the panel of speakers. Uh, there's a dandelion clock, and that's to symbolize the passage of time and healing again. Um, and then the little white flowers at the top are stitch worked to symbolize my craft. Uh, to the bottom right, so this is a found textile, and to the bottom right, there's some daisies and rosebuds embroidered. And I see working with textiles of this kind, found textiles as a bit of a collaboration with um, needle people of the past. So embroidery artists of the past who, unfortunately, we don't know who they are. They didn't leave a signature, but I can sort of have this conversation with them through adding my own embroidery. Um, and I often work in this way. So I um, am currently working on a tablecloth which is embroidered with blue and yellow floral motifs uh, and I'm layering that with embroidery transfers, images and text. So this next embroidery, uh, there's not much symbolism going on here, this is just a straightforward depiction of my bedroom. I found the rug in the centre with the tiger on it online um, after one that me and my brother had had growing up in a childhood bedroom, which was pretty much the same, except on a blue rather than a green background, fell to bits. And that rug had been made by my dad's grandmother. Um, so it's sort of about my childhood and my dad's childhood and family. Um, so there's a nice link there. The technique I've used to make the rug is turkey rug stitch. So you make lots and lots of little loops and stitch them down and then you can cut them quite fine to give a sort of velvety or shagpile effect. 
Um, and then being a millennial, there's lots of plants in the embroidery. Um, I feel like that's sort of like a prerequisite for almost <laughs> for millennials. Okay, and then the final embroidery, this is called Catching Flies. Um, and in this embroidery, the animal is conspicuous by his absence. So he's a frog and I'll come on to him in a minute, but this is an embroidery about friendship, recovery, safe spaces and dreams. The words, lovely to hear from you, even had a dream about you. You were in the highlands and apparently one of your jobs up there is to wait for a frog to greet you. He always arrives eventually, though it can take him a while to hop. We're taken verbatim from a dream, um, a text my friend sent me about a dream she had while I was uh, in the early days of recovery from a severe mental illness. And they fit with experiences I've enjoyed in recovery, such as seeing uh, the Kew giant water lilies for the first time, which at certain times of year have these amazing reddish pink edges to them. And also hearing the frog croak uh, in the first lockdown, which it was not something I'd think I'd experience, but you know, it was so quiet at times then that <laughs> I could actually hear that. So uh, the Highlands, as I've mentioned, are a safe space for me um, where I go to feel tranquility. The title refers to sleeping with your mouth open, dreaming, but also to the frog who has not yet appeared in the composition. This piece is about the comfort of being in loved one's thoughts when recovering and being so well known that their dreams reflect your reality. The beaded text emulates text messages, particularly in the early days of mobile phones when they were against a green background. Um, and modern communications technology was invaluable in the pandemic, of course, and particularly for disabled people. The, uh, the embroidery is a wall hanging which hangs from a beach branch, um, which represents High Beach and Epping Forest, which is another safe space of mine. I'll just show you a detail. So this is me sitting, waiting for the frog to arrive. Um, and my outfit is based on frog from the Frog and Toad series of stories. <laughs> so um, frog wears outfits very much like these in those stories for children. Uh, this is my most amb ambitious embroidery to date. I'm now working on an even more ambitious one with uh, a beaded universe, 3D embroidered holly leaves and berries and hundreds of spiders, which as you've seen is another animal I've often embroidered. Um, and this piece will be shown at the Outside In Humanity Exhibition, which opens in Sotheby's in January um, and then travels to Glasgow and to Brighton. Thank you, Kate. That was, I can't begin to say, and um, I'm just going to a couple of the um, live chats where Emily says, I want you to do my future wedding dress, Kate. <laughs> and later, what a beautiful, comforting piece. Laura Brody says, love the work and details on your technique. Zipporah Johnston says, wonderful. So I'm going to leave all the other questions till the end and I'm going to ask Nula to come on and introduce herself and her work now. So I'm really delighted to welcome for the first time to the festival Nula Abramson. Hello, um, I'm Nula Abramson. I'm uh, an artist. I've just graduated from Glasgow School of Art and I live in Glasgow still. Um, I'm a white non-binary woman with brown hair and faded pink highlights and wearing a brown check shirt. Um, I'm just going to share my presentation for a bit about um, something I've been working on recently. Recently, the past year, I just finished um, my degree and for that, I developed a body of work based around symbolism of the snake. Um, and this is just about how I sort of came to that symbolism and one of the pieces I made with it. Um, so it started off with one of my favourite stories, this is The Speckled Band. It's an imperial gothic short story from one of the earlier Sherlock Holmes novels. Um, in it, 
the fear of reverse contamination from Britain's colonial projects is represented by a snake. Um, the story follows when Dr. Grimsby Roylott, he is the man who worked as a doctor in Calcutta, and at the time that was a British colony in India, he was said to have a passion for Indian animals. And he was the last member of a very old English family and said to be corrupted by a long re residence in the tropics. This was a character who was believed to have been corrupted by the East where he'd been living and working. And he brought back violence from that place in the form of a deadly snake, which he uses to kill his stepdaughters. This represents a fear of contamination from the colonial uh, projects that Britain had at the time. And it can also be seen in the Gothic short story, Jane Eyre, where the mad woman in the attic has come from the colonies and brought madness into the life of an old English gentleman. Also in the Victorian use of the vampire mythos, you can see a lot of fear of the physical contamination brought from Eastern cultures. The symbolic qualities of the snake um, that I really appealed to me were its ability to flow between boundaries and the idea of flowing and transcending boundaries and transgressing had been something I've been really interested in, in terms of the queer theory I've been reading and the post-colonial and anti-imperial theory that I've also been reading. In the story, The Speckled Band, the house is said to have solid walls, floors, and barred up chimneys, but that's not a barrier to how it can flow silently through the smallest spaces. Also, the poison from its fangs can flow through the body, and in it, the stepdaughter's British blood was poisoned by what was called an untraceable Eastern poison. So a book that was really interesting to me and really helped um, with my theoretical reading of Gothic literature was Epidemic Empire by Anjuli Fatima Raza Kolb. And it links the early study of epidemiology, which is the study of infectious disease to the colonial projects. Uh, this, this early study of disease was linked increasingly to um, justification for colonizing uh, the East from the West. Um, and also the spread of disease is integral to the study of migration of people. This fear of contamination from the infectious other from the East guided Victorian imperialism and it also currently guides immigration policy today. You can see in both immigration and epidemic popular media, words are used such as waves or flood, as if both the movement of people and the movement of infectious diseases are natural forces which need control from Western policy, rather as human results of our imperial history and of the neoliberal capitalist economics and healthcare, which has decimated our healthcare system. So snakes in my work show up as I like to layer images on top of each other, like a palimpsest. A palimpsest is an ancient Greek method of wax tablet writing where you would write on the wax tablet and then wipe away your words. But the images of the traces of what had been written before would always show up. And this is an interesting metaphor for me in terms of looking at how history has been written and overwritten by different groups of people. The snake is a symbol of this fear of the flow between culturally enforced boundaries. It's a symbol that I've used to investigate queer phobia, neo-colonial policies, capitalist economics, disability rights, and the idea of madness. So another book that I found really interesting was The Anatomical Venus by Joanna Ebenstein. And she looks at this uh, Enlightenment era wax sculptures of anatomical um, women who you could open up their wax bodies and look inside and see anatomically correct lungs and hearts and intestines, etc. cetera. Um, that followed through to a Victorian tradition of a sideshow where the other was displayed and the other was seen as the non-white, the intersex and the disabled. 
This spectacle of what was seen as abnormal was used to publicly cement the normal in the public consciousness. This idea of a spectacle is really fascinating to me in terms of how it tells about surveillance as used to enforce certain methods of categorization according to Western knowledge systems and to strengthen Western defenses against the feared deviant and the silently contaminating other. So my snake sampler took these ideas um, and made a white work embroidery from them. Uh, I was interested in Epidemic Empire, the book I mentioned before, talked about how zoological documentation was a part of empire building, as knowledge is collected, decontextualized from its original source and turned into imperial knowledge, which is then used to replace indigenous knowledge. Um, a collection of images by uncredited Indian artists was collated by an art, uh, Major Thomas Hardwick, who was a major in the British Army and in Indian colonies in the 1830s. So this image of the snake comes from that book. The shapes in the circle around the snake are from a slide from a cholera infected water sample in the early 1900s. And the flow of people in an increasingly liberalized globe caused new avenues for disease to spread. This caused anxiety for people in Britain during Victorian times and before. Anytime there was great colonial attempts at expansion, it caused a more liberalized global movement and therefore disease could spread more easily. Such diseases, such as cholera especially, there were many cholera epidemics, especially throughout the whole of the 1800s. These were seen as Eastern diseases, which were contaminating, brought back to infect the Western body politic and to weaken the Western defenses against these others. So this anxiety over reverse contamination as we colonized cause a circular feeling of need for aggressive methods of empire building in order to keep strengthening Western defenses against the contaminating other. So the next piece that I'm gonna talk about has also got a snake just in the body. Um, and I wanted to look at this idea of flow and contamination and how it affects queer bodies. So snake, I saw as a queer object, it's something that can get through and transcend boundaries and sneak slowly. And this is really reflective of this fear of the deviant queer other as a silent contaminate, contaminant uh, upon traditional Christian values. And this is integral to queer fear. It's also, um, you can see it through the fear of indigenous and pagan traditions up to when the lavender menace was seen as a corrupting force in feminism in America and Britain in the early 1900s. Then the Red Scare and McCarthyism, where this deviant queer other was associated with this communist wanting to overthrow the Western capitalist agenda. The satanic panic was also a fear of the 80s where corrupting forces including the queer and the non-Christian would influence uh, good Christian white families. And then the gay and trans agenda you see now, especially in the recent violence in the club Q shooting and in the Pulse shooting, where this fearful agenda is meant to be corrupting our most innocent, such as our children. Um, this right-wing conservative ideology has always led to fascism and violence as an imagined protective and defensive force. And that's so linked to the colonizing and empire building, which our country is built on from the near past um, as a defensive force against the corrupted, the non-Christian and the contaminating other that we created. Um, and yeah, that's all for me. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much, Nuda. Um, I'm just going to bring in a couple of the comments. 
and Laura says, I really appreciate your scholarship. And actually, I wanted to pick up on that, Nuda, and say, I really appreciated how accessible you made that. Thanks. I do worry a lot about, like, I'm so lucky and privileged to have had the time and the university education to access such scholarship. And I find it really useful and rich in, like, looking at how I interact with the world and trying to articulate that in a way that can appeal to people who haven't maybe had the type of privileges that I have, I think is really important. And so well, I really I think, appreciate that. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I've spent a lot of time in academia and I think, you know, I think you did that very successfully. Anyway, I'm going to move on now and introduce Sapora Johnston. And then after that, we'll all join in and we'll ask some questions and we'll get to hear more from the artists. So if you'd like to join us now, Sapora, and I will say goodbye for a minute. Thank you very much. Um, so, quick introduction, I'm Sephora. Um, I am a white woman wearing a black hat with long dark hair and uh, wearing glasses. Um, and I'm an embroidery artist uh, based in Edinburgh. Um, the kinds of embroidery that I specialise in are uh, thread painting, um, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, so you're building up a, a detailed image using stitches rather than paint, um, and also stump work. Um, which is a type of raised embroidery um, that has a, a history dating back to the Middle Ages. And I combine the two techniques to essentially create little textile sculptures um, and combine that with found objects and installation work. Um, and this is um, this piece here is called Amulet Against Eye Contact, and that's uh, combining both those techniques. So um, the focus of most of my work over the last few years has been uh, the Museum of Monotropism, um, which is an evolving installation about the way that I experience the world um, as an autistic person. So it's, it's basically a museum of my brain. Um, and the staging here in this photograph um, is at the Nuke Collective ex uh, group exhibition in uh, 2021. So um, monotropism is a fancy way of saying that the autistic brain tends to hyper-focus on a, a restricted range of interests or activities um, and struggles to shift focus outside these attention tunnels. Um, so that manifests itself um, in having trouble switching between tasks um, and also in having very intense, um, I call special interests um, in often unusual topics. Um, and because of the way that autism is diagnosed, um, which is, very heavy on kind of a deficit model um, and the ways in which we're like quote unquote not normal. Um, monotropism or special interests, um, they're often pathologized in as something bad, um, you know, something that children have to be encouraged out of. Um, but they don't need to be seen this way um, because many of us experience our monotropism as something good, as like a source of pleasure and flow. Um, and for me, monotropism is, is just the lens through which I see the world. And I actually think that embroidery is kind of the perfect medium for uh, talking about monotropism because it's inherently monotropic. You know, you need to give yourself over to the repetition and be utterly focused on each stitch, especially with the type of embroidery that, that I do, thread painting. Um, and embroidering is one of those times when I experience that sense of flow. Um, so this is um, just, uh, this next couple of slides are just a couple of objects from the museum. Um, this one is an amulet against eye contact. Um, being autistic, me and eye contact don't get on very well. Um, so I made a couple, kind of a series of these amulets to ward it off um, and also to convey um, a degree of how unsettling it, it is to be stared at. Um, this one is another amulet. Um, it was uh, kind of dealing with the anxieties that I have about um, being separated from friends. You know, I, I used to live abroad and when I left, it was like a, a big um, trauma <laughs> to leave behind friendships. And um, there's always that anxiety that you will, you will lose that connection as the, as the time goes on. Um, so, by making the installation, um, I just really wanted to show a version of autism that wasn't about distress or deficit, um, because 
while there are a lot of things that I find difficult, um, I think there's also a lot of beauty in the way that, that we experience the world. Um, and then this slide is um, pictures of two museums in Oxford, the, the Oxford Natural History Museum and the, and the Pitt Rivers Museum. Um, so the, the Museum of Monotropism installation is a single kind of self-contained room with a, a mixture of my embroidery and my anthropological and natural history collections uh, laid out as a museum. Um, but it sort of was um, divided slightly in half between a section that was devoted to um, you know, folk religion and magic and uh, the, the natural world. And that's because it's kind of mirroring this double museum complex in Oxford, um, the, the Natural History Museum and, and Pitt Rivers. And the Pitt Rivers in particular uh, is, is as much a museum of the Victorian brain as anything else. So some cases have hundreds of the same objects laid out in rows, um, others are stuffed with collections of artifacts that don't belong together to like a modern eye. Um, so, you know, there'll be a 19th century shrine next to a preserved toad from North Africa, next to uh, an early modern witch in a bottle. Um, but to me, it also kind of felt like the inside of my brain, because um, this is also how I process the world. Um, you know, I, I kind of hoard objects and information, turn them over and over, and, and I make connections that seem obvious to me. Um, but maybe don't necessarily make so much sense to other people. Um, and that's what I try to convey in, in the, the installation. Um, you know, that this mix of the artifacts from my, my two special interests, uh, natural history and, and folk magic, um, and drawing out the ways that they interconnect in my mind. Um, so these are from the installation. Um, and I guess these are kind of me trying to do on a much smaller scale um, what I was trying to do in the museum as a whole. Um, they are called the Plant Lives Cabinets. Um, and they're a series of curiosity cabinets. Um, I made about five linchpin British plant species. Um, so clover, bird's foot trefoil, nettle, rowan, and dandelion. And they're kind of miniature museums of each of the plant. Um, so each, each one started with a pressed specimen of the, the plant in question. Um, and then I added found objects, um, paper cuts that I made and embroidery that represent the plant's role in the ecosystem and in human history uh, and culture and belief. And the idea is to say something about how the plant species, um, like how we all depend on them, um, and also about how my brain works and how it makes sense to me when I look at a plant, this is what, these are the thoughts that are like popping up to me. Um, and, um, you know, these are the connections that I naturally make. Um, so my insect work also arose um, from thinking about museums, um, partly because I was deep in an obsession with butterflies and moths at the time, um, and partly because there's something about the Victorian butterfly collecting mania that, again, feels very monotropic um, and really speaks to me. Um, and so the, the butterfly cases started as an homage to that. Um, but when I was showing them at the first iteration of the Museum of Monotropism uh, back in 2019, um, something a little bit odd happened. Um, during the show, one lady came up to me uh, to tell me off for cruelty to animals um, because she thought that the moths and butterflies were real um, and that I had killed and mounted them. Um, and on one level, it was a bit funny, um, but it was also quite sad um, because the only reason that um, you, know, you could mistake the butterflies for real ones at, at such close quarters um, is because you're not very familiar with butterflies. Um, you know, if you encounter them regularly and you're familiar with butterflies, you, you know how beautiful and delicate and ethereal they are. And you, you couldn't possibly mistake the thread versions for the real thing. And it, it really drove home how utterly divorced from nature, like so many of us have become in, in cities. So um, this kind of got into my brain um, and provided a new motivation for my work. Um, which is getting people to look at and care about insects um, and getting them to care about the insect apocalypse that we're already living through. 
um, because they, they really symbolize the, the bigger environmental crisis. You know, they're, they're really canaries in the coal mine. Um, over the last 50 years, global insect populations have declined by 75%. Um, you know, it's, it's really staggering. And the reasons essentially boil down to human activity. So um, man-made climate change, pesticides, habitat loss, uh, and pollution, um, they're all having a catastrophic effect on invertebrates. And we are so dependent on insects, um, far more than people realize. You know, we, we need them for pest control, for pollination, uh, maintaining soil health so that we can actually grow crops in the first place. Um, and it's also because of insects that we're not buried under dead bodies and dung and, uh, you know, senescent vegetation and stuff, um, because they break that, that down and recycle it back into the ecosystem. Um, and they're also the foundation of many food chains. So, you know, without insects, uh, there would not be bird, amphibian, mammal, reptile life, and, and human life would be over. And we are really on a knife edge right now. Um, and it kind of terrifies me that so few people see it um, and so few people care. Um, so I, I started making work um, that tried to kind of get people to notice and care about insects and their decline. And I thought that maybe if I could get people to see them the way that I do, um, they might want to protect them. So I started making moths, um, you know, the, the uh, unloved cousins of butterflies. Um, but they're so incredibly beautiful and fascinating once you actually stop and, and look at them. Um, kind of so often people feel instant revulsion at the thought of insects um, and it makes it really easy to dismiss them. Um, and I think kindling a sense of wonder and respect is like the first step to getting people to take action. Um, so that's also what I was trying to do achieve with the individual bumblebees that I started making, um, so in, especially the endangered species like um, here on the left is the um, moss carder bee, um, on, on the right is the shrill carder bumblebee and that's the, probably the rarest bee in Britain now. Um, and I, I find that people really enjoyed um, seeing them but also like getting to kind of hold these like tiny embroidered bees. Um, and that's, that kind of really drew people in. And, and although they started by asking about how I made them um, and how I got them so small, um, once the kind of the, the gates of wonder had been opened um, and, you know, the, once they, they, they started feeling this sort of sense of attachment to the, to the embroidered bee, um, they were much more open to a conversation about what is happening to real life bees. Um, and, and so I, I kind of hope that the, the, the embroideries can act as kind of little ambassadors for their uh, real life counterpart. Um, so I think that's probably uh, my time up, um, but I would be happy to answer any questions um, that you have. Uh, and also um, this, these are my contact details. Uh, please feel free to get in touch if you have any questions or you wanna talk embroidery. Thank you so much, Sapora. I think we could all sit here and ask questions of all three of you for hours and hours and hours. I'm just going to pick up a couple of comments. Laura says these are glorious. Um, Sonia says, love your work and interpretation of monotropism, so exciting. And Karen says, I love your work. I too love the details that I'm always drawn to and which I find hugely important. I see the jewels surrounding the eyes in your amulets as pieces, as places that my autistic eye can focus on instead of the eye itself. How I realise I don't make contact, although people think I do because I'm actually concentrating on another near detail on the face. And um, Sonia also says, seeing the beauty of insects, so important, so gorgeous. Would the other two artists like to join us now, which I think is if you put your microphones on and Emily will pop a spotlight on you. I'm because of the limits of time, I'm going to resist coming to you about your individual practice, because I think all of us could and would love to talk to each of you for hours. And we're going to have to think about ways to do that in the future. But I'm interested, you know, what your exhibition shows in the work of the three of you is that embroidery is such an incredible fine art form. But I think until this exhibition, it's not even a, an art form that I'd really considered in the last 10 years as artistic director. 
do you think it's because it's seen as something that women do? I mean, I know it's not just something that women do, but do you think that's one of the reasons, you know, what, what kind of responses have you had when you've chosen, you know, that you've chosen this form? Do you want me to talk? <laughs> yeah. no, um, I find that like often anything that isn't part of the traditional Western art canon, which is for since Enlightenment times especially has been about painting, anything is relegated to its own sort of niche as if that's the other to the canon's norm. Uh, and embroidery is one of those because it's um, more traditionally done in craft houses or for a purpose or has been associated with women, especially in Western culture for a couple of hundred years. Yeah. So we're looking at, at sexism, racism and classism effectively. Mm. And I, I think that's that strikes such a note in Newham. I mean, only 16% of the population identify as white British. And one of the frustrations I've always had about having no gallery is there's nowhere to exhibit all of the work from all of the different cultures that are represented here and to allow that fusion of art forms to develop. Because I'm sure there's many residents, as you say, would come from cultures originally, which would have a much, much higher place. I mean, you're, the, yeah, the three of you, I think your work is absolutely stunning. Did Kate, Sipora, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, um, just to pick up on what Eula was saying, um, that I've got a quote here that's um, in 1770, the Royal Academy brought in a rule stating that no needlework, flowers, cut paper, shell work or any such baubles shall be admitted. So that was effectively... Um, excluding crafts and by extension women from the Royal Academy and you know real gatekeeping um, as you were saying that that western art canon and I think there's still a certain snootiness perhaps about embroidery that it's a it's just a handicraft or maybe historically that it's because it's something that for a couple of hundred years had been done predominantly by women it was just something that women did it was almost like intrinsic to femaleness and it wasn't, there wasn't more thought than that behind it. I think it's so interesting what you say about the kind of the skill element, because of course the other side of craft is it, it's a skill, you know, and I hesitate to say it, but you know, sometimes that could be a lot more skilled than somebody who just paints. But it reminds me of going to a couple of openings at the Tate where sort of marveling at the different aspects of the installation and then discovering that other people have crafted all of those different aspects and the artist has brought it together, which, you know, I'm not knocking, particularly as a disabled person who uses support, but I think it's really interesting that there's almost that sort of, let's keep the people down who've got the real skills, who tend to be the more working class people, you know, mm -hmm. and the artists who very often are, as Nuda identified, you know, people who've come from certainly not always but often privileged backgrounds are then able to make use of those people with the crafts it's just such a fascinating area so Paula did you want to add anything to that um yeah no, I, I think that femininity is a big part of the way that embroidery is dismissed um but I think it's also about domesticity um like, you know like Kate was saying that it's um it's the fripperies that women do at home. Um, I, I think like if, if you look at now at like the big shows in Scotland, the, the, the BAS and the, the SSA shows, um, you will see ceramics and glass and even stained glass and, and that kind of thing and weaving definitely are, are making an appearance now. Um, but embroidery is really not. Um, most of the embroiderers I know who've submitted have been rejected. Um, and it's something about like the I think more than other craft mediums, there's something about embroidery that is still struggling to kind of be taken seriously. And I, and I think some of it is to do with the fact that it's kind of associated with little girls doing samplers or grandmas making tea throw cloths or whatever. And there is this sense that it's, you know, art is serious business and embroidery is uh, kind of fluffy and uh, homemaking. 
then of course we still live in a world where even when it comes to painting i forget what the statistic is whether it's that men earn twice as much for their paintings or 10 times as much but i have an idea it's 10 times as much so if you look at tracy emin and damien hurst damien hurst's paintings even if they're made by somebody else are worth 10 times what tracy emin's are worth and it's quite extraordinary that idea that women's time is not important you know actually still permeates throughout the whole of the art world but i think that idea of domestic is also really important because it's also about what older people might do what people might you know as you say what people might do at home then becomes disabled people do you think disabled artists are really leading the way in re-establishing a place for embroidery because on the basis of looking at all of your work i mean i could see any or all of you ending up as turner prize with that work so it's quite extraordinary to me that people can't see that you know more clearly but then like i say women are, dism are dismissed as artists in terms of value but do you think disabled artists are really kind of in the forefront of this because perhaps we don't care so much you know we're so used to people dismissing us and telling us we can, what we can't do and that everything we do is valueless and then we manage somehow to shrug that off and do it anyway i think the environment that comes with a lot of contemporary art making is so it's difficult for anyone who isn't like white and a man <laughs> Uh, having just graduated from art school, it's just a very difficult environment in order to justify your space in, unless you're seen as the normal person to be in that space. So I think a lot of disabled artists who maybe feel left out of these spaces will choose a different medium um, or a medium which leads you to a different kind of making things. Um, yeah, that's definitely been my perspective anyway. It's well, I think it's one of the great things about embroidery that you don't have to have, you know, I mean, I think it's it's very clear from all of your work that it, it works in a studio, but you don't have to have a studio mm -hmm. and you don't have to have incredibly expensive equipment. And I think contemporary art has become more and more about, well, if you can't afford the studio and you can't afford the equipment and you sort of think somewhere along the line, this all comes back to art it's not actually about the studio it's not actually about the kit i mean there's obviously a huge amount of skill in what you're doing but i hope that kate's also going to be able to demonstrate on tuesday that it's not intrinsic you know you i believe you can do fine art embroidery in ways that doesn't have to have that fine manual dexterity i mean kate do you think how do you see it as an accessible art form and where do you see the access barriers so I've embroidered on buses and trains, uh, in bed, even in the bath, although I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. Um, and like you say, it is quite low cost and you can do it pretty much anywhere. You know, you can have the telly on in the background and do it and have a couple of friends and embroider. Um, so that makes it friendlier maybe in a way as well. Um, because you can have a stitching bitch, you know? <laughs> um, and um, barriers, I suppose. Yeah, it depends on, I mean, I can't do the level of fine detail that either of the other two uh, are capable of creating, I think. I think I, I, I'm i dyspraxic and I, my manual dexterity isn't always the best, but there are, there are different techniques, you know, that can be, entered at different sort of levels and points and um yeah it's accessible in that way so i'm just going to go to a couple of the questions um so claire is asking everybody can i ask about your experiences of school art education and did anything at school switch you on to embroidery <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't do it at school and I, I, I didn't go to art school or anything um, so uh, I don't know what the situation is in, in uh, tertiary education these days but certainly at, at uh, primary and, and high school we did no sewing at all. Yeah I mean I'm I'm 60 she says but I, I did cross stitch and that was what you did at school you did cross stitch and you didn't do anything else when you finished your cross stitch there was nowhere to go so <laughs> I still have my school cross stitches but nothing beyond that I, I, don't 
Um, I did a little bit of embroidery in school uh, for my GCSE textiles and really enjoyed it. But then I didn't pick it up again until just before my second year of art school. I'd had a breakdown and it was part of my recovery. So it was interesting to see someone talking about uh, the World War II, World War One, sorry, um, rehabilitation of shell shock soldiers um, uh, using embroidery. In, in their recovery because it was so important for me when I was studying uh, writing and I felt that I couldn't really write or make sense of my experience but I could embroider. Yeah yeah just about art school I think like it did feel like such a alien environment to me I really did not feel welcome I couldn't like talk the talk or care about the things that people wanted you to mm. um and I took a break at the end of my third year um because I also had really difficult mental health problems and I think embroidery is something and textiles in general it's such a sensuous medium you can really feel what you're doing and it's all just building up stitch by stitch so you can just start something and just keep just one bit by one bit and I find that ethos is really important just to like live as an autistic person just small bit by small bit um so embroidery really appealed to me in that way and then bringing it into a fine art space was um I don't know there's varying reactions people mostly just didn't really know what to think about it <laughs> uh yeah <laughs> yeah that usually means you're destined for a better career than the people who can be pigeonholed easily I mean can I ask all of you what kind of encouragement you have had and there is there is like a, a parallel world of textile art, like mm. um, that it kind of exists separate to the fine art world, and I have found it incredibly supportive, much more so than the the fine art world. And um, part of me is kind of like asking, kind of why we are so worried about the fine art world accepting us. Like maybe what we need to be doing is is bringing textile art to like a wider audience and because it's a nicer place to be it's a much more supportive place to be um you know there, there is um I, I would say that there is one issue in the textile art world which is that um you will get contacted by a lot of people asking you to tell you how to mm -hmm. recreate your work stitch by stitch in a way that like my friends who paint do not do not get these <laughs> instagram messages and so that can be quite and people can be quite aggressive and that can be unpleasant but that's not the artists doing that like the artists are always respectful and kind and like they've mentored me and things so I wonder if there's a bit of a tradition because that just struck a note and I remember somebody I think really when I was doing my PhD research so at least 25 years ago but she'd she'd made something a very sort of special embroidery and then lots of people were asking her for the pattern and she was really happy to share it and I'm wondering whether there's a kind of hobby element where people are getting a little bit mixed up and thinking oh that's that's kind of what we're going to do but I so I can understand that there is a kind of somewhere out there with some people there seems to be a bit of a tradition but you're absolutely right they're not doing well of course they might be painting by numbers taking a screenshot and using the tracing paper you just don't know but at least everybody wants to do it and I think that's it's clearly really really speaking to people there's so much I mean Claire says this work is amazing there was a lovely resonance between the three of you yes I mean I definitely think you should continue to exhibit together um Karen is saying yes or people wanting me to recreate some of my pieces with a focus on the subject of their choice it's a bit like <laughs> do it again but make it pink to match the bedroom I think may, yeah maybe that's a, maybe that is an art thing and it's just kind of more obvious if you're working in textile art but there's probably yeah I've certainly been asked about kind of whether something could just kind of go a little bit better with the sofa um, we're almost at an end. I was really anxious about whether we could cover a subject like embroidery online, but very clearly we can. And I think very clearly there's just lots and lots and lots more to be said. I'm so pleased to have three of you who are, well, Nuna's very much at the beginning of her career. And I think, you know, you're all emerging artists. I think you've got a fantastic future. I absolutely love your work. I'm so pleased to be able to have it. So I'd like to thank you for sharing that work and your thoughts with us tonight. 
I'd also like to thank our funders, Arts Council England and Newham Council, whose support has enabled us to run the festival again in 2022. Thanks to our board and our community advisory board members who give up their time to help us to create the best organisation possible. Thanks to our access support workers, Norma McKay from Global Real Time Captioning and Chris Burrow from Burrow Interpreting, who very much become part of our regular team over the years. And thanks to the whole Together 2012 team, including our club's programme manager, Alison Marchant, social media lead, Renee Wallen, media lead Laura Horton and my PA Emily Welsh and finally thanks to all of you for attending and for supporting this our 11th and final Together Disability History Month Festival but we will be moving to a new year-round programme next year so I'd just like to say if you'd like to spend more time with Kate talking embroidery and in particular talking about accessible eco-embroidery techniques then we have a workshop Greenwich Mean Time 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock next Tuesday um, I think Karen and Sonia sum it up karen says i've loved this event thanks to you all and sonia says fascinating work love it and laura says i look forward to seeing more of all of your work and i know so do we christy the snoring cat behind me also says thank you very much and she particularly loved the Cardi B. so i'm just going to say good night to everybody now have a very good evening thank you. Thank you. Thank you.